And there it was, the jingle that for almost 10 years meant that London was listening to one of the most distinctive broadcasters there has ever been. Along with cruising, the three o'clock thrill, the hit line, the hall of fame, and a host of other music radio elements, ladies and gentlemen, it was part of a show that established the name of Roger Scott. And for the next hour or so, we're going to enjoy music and memories that we associate with the man every one of us knew. We knew him as a favorite broadcaster, as a valued colleague, and much, much more for those who are privileged to know him well, to also love him very deeply. However we knew Roger, every one of us knows that there was one passion that absolutely dominated his life. And of course, that was a commitment to good music. And whenever the subject came up, our Roger was very, very proud to acknowledge the one song and the one sing singer that started his love affair with music. Come on, pretty baby, let's move it out, move it. Shake, baby, shake, but honey, please don't lose it. This rhythm that gets into your heart and soul. Let me tell you people, it's called rock and roll Say it's gonna die, but honey, please let's face it Just don't know what's going to replace it Pals, Eclipse will have or nothing on Real country music that just drives along Honey, move it But honey, please don't lose it This rhythm that gets into your heart and soul Well, let me tell you people It's called rock and roll They say it's gonna die, but honey Please let's face it They just don't know what's going to replace it well, ballads and calypsos have on nothing on Real country music that just drives along Honey, move it Well, ballads and calypsos have on nothing on Real country music that just drives along Honey, move it Honey, move it Honey, move it And particularly, it's taking part, part in it uh, because it's happening here at Abbey Road. Uh, I started my career in Studio Two and spent five years after 63 battling with the Beatles to get in there. I always thought that EMI was giving preference to them because whenever I phoned, Paul McCartney was in. And when I met <laughs> Paul some years later, he actually said that whenever he phoned, I was in. So EMI was being impartial. But for me, to <coughs> celebrate and to remember someone like Roger is a great privilege. There are a lot of people who do things for our industry, and he's got to be at the top of the list. He did wonderful things for our music, uh, for enthusing and uh, for encouraging. And as I say, it's a great privilege to be part of this event. Thank you for having me, and uh, long may his memory reign. Thank you. Sir. The song and the singer recognized by Roger and by so many other aficionados as the first British rock and roll hit 
And Cliff, thank you so much for being with us today. As you said, like so many of the records that were important to Roger, Move It was, of course, recorded here, the Abbey Road Studios. <coughs> Pardon me. And, of course, it's no accident that Roger's friends chose this particular place, this particular location, to celebrate his life. And we all owe something to Abbey Road, I think. And we would like to say particularly thank you to EMI for enabling us all to meet here today. Yes, quite nice. <clears throat> and incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, I know that you'd all like to join in thanking David Oxtoby for uh, designing the invitations. And uh, on the way out, I must tell you that you will notice a donation, uh, a donation box out there, which is referred to on the back of your invitation, and we hope that you will look at that donation box very, very kindly indeed. Right, let us go on, because this is a celebration of the life of the great Roger Scott. And it's fascinating how the paths of music lovers do cross. For instance, somebody who was listening to Roger Scott long before any of us got to hear him was a certain Mr. Paul Gambaccini. That's right, Alan. I know this is the type of uh, program that Roger would have loved, where the disc jockeys talk between the music and not over it. I did have the great privilege of hearing Roger Scott before anybody else in this room. And that's because in the late 60s, I was a student at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. And northern New England was very ill-served by radio at this time. And so at night, if we wanted to hear popular music, we had to tune in to those faraway signals of distant stations. And there were five DJs that I can recall listening to at that time. One was Dick Summer out of Boston. Uh, another one was Tommy Shannon out of Detroit. Uh, there was Jefferson Kay out of Buffalo. And from other upstate New York stations, a man called Joey Reynolds and this Roger Scott. I had no idea what he looked like. But I, young music-loving student that I was, related to him entirely and listened to him almost on a daily basis, even through the crackle and uh, the faraway signal. You know, I don't have to tell you how committed he was to music, even at that time, because about a month ago, uh, say, on Radio 1, he actually said in one of his last broadcasts that he first heard the letter by the box tops and played it 12 consecutive times on that upstate New York <laughs> station. That's how deeply he was into the music and how little he cared for the disapproval of the bosses. I think that's something else that followed through his career. How many of us DJs remember how Roger would comment on the news right after the news. None of us would ever dare do that. But he didn't mind. I think that in 1986, Roger and David Jensen and I decided that in 1987, we should hold our 21st, or rather our 20th anniversary party. Because all of us had started about the same time within an 18 month period. And I guess the main reason we never had that party, we was so fascinated by the idea that we could have it, that for that long we were paid to do something we loved. Roger loved music and radio, and it's no accident that the people here today represent the cream of broadcasting and popular music. Those are the people he admired, those are the people who loved him. Well, you can imagine my excitement when, studies finished, I came to live in London in 1975, and who should I meet but Roger Scott? And we became very friendly. As a matter of fact, I think Roger was probably the reason I listened to Capital when I was on Radio 1, and the reason I listened to Radio 1 when I was on Capital. <laughs> One of the prize photos in my photo album is of Roger and I at a Beach Boys reception in the mid-70s. And there we are with our notorious clothes sense. I've got a mustache and horrible sideburns and a, a red t-shirt and plaid trousers. And Roger's got a sweaty t-shirt and those shorts. <laughs> you know, just like the first cuckoo always used to tell you that spring was on the way, Roger in shorts meant that the temperature was above 10 centigrade. <laughs> I think he had the most known legs in broadcasting, including Ann Nightingale. Around that time, and I want the record to know this, I was the first disc jockey to champion Bruce Springsteen. Roger was the second and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And the only reason I'd been the first was because the manager was an old friend of mine and had sent me an advance pressing. The fact is, when Roger heard something that was good, he knew it, and he couldn't wait to share it with everyone. And he did share it with everyone through the many years. And that's one reason why he lasted 
so long at the top of the heap because the listeners, regardless of fads or fancies in popular music, knew that he would give them the best. And that's exactly what he did. Broadcasters in this room today should well consider his achievement. In this country, ILR and national radio. In the United States, local commercial radio and national syndication. He actually completed the clean sweep that everyone dreams of and did everything. Roger, in about 1992, it'll be about time for that 25th anniversary party. David Jensen and I will have it, and we know you'll be there watching and listening, just as you now are watching us and telling us not to be sentimental and to get on with it. <laughs> you know he always did. And I know that in that time, he'll be waiting to hear, and we make that promise at that party that Roger made with his radio programs every day throughout all those years, the music will be good. Thank you very much, Paul Gambaccini and lovely Leslie Scott. We promise you that he's up there and he's looking down and furthermore, he is giggling, all right? The joy of today's event is that all of us can claim a link with Roger. All of us desperately want to claim that link with Roger. And that goes as much for those on stage as for the rest of us, all right? Because the music making of Mr. Dave Edmonds and Mr. Nick Lowe was sort of never very far from Roger's programs, and we are delighted to welcome them here today to this celebration. Funny and no funny, Tuesday's a blue day, Wednesday's a Wednesday, Thursday's the worst day, Friday's great, cause I can hardly wait until the weekend. I should be clocking in at eight, but I'm a little late. Can't blame my baby, cause I took her on a date. It's two till ten, and then it's Friday again. Here comes the weekend. Here comes the weekend. Here comes the weekend. My working week's so tough, I think I've had enough. Until the weekend. I've had an overdose of doctor's notes, but it just don't ease the pain. Going on the sick. Don't do the trick Cause sooner or later I'll be clocking in again Working like a dog for the ten hours a day Never see enough for my take home pay They pay me for the shift like they was given a gift Here comes the weekend Doctor's notes, but it just don't ease the pain Going on the sick, don't do the trick Cause sooner or later I'll be clocking in again Someday I'll be able to forget my working day Life will be a grin because my ship is coming in Everything will go my way and I won't have to say Here comes the weekend Here comes the weekend Here comes the weekend my working week's so tough, I think I've had enough Until the weekend Here comes the weekend Here comes the weekend Here comes the weekend Ever had attended It had to happen on our very first day 
28 And he has a brother and he's hot on my trail Her daddy wants to ride me out of town on a rail I hope I'll be around when Jenny gets out of jail Boy Jenny I went downtown to see if she was locked in a cell She wasn't very glad to see me, that I could tell In fact, to tell the truth, she wasn't looking too well Poor Jenny Her eyes were black, her face was red, her hair was a fright She looked as though she'd been a-crying half of the night I told her I was sorry, she said, get out of sight Poor Jenny Jenny had a picture in the paper this morning She made it with a bang According to the story in the paper this morning Jenny is the leader of a teenage gang Jenny has a brother and he's hot on my trail Her daddy wants to ride me out of town on the rail I hope I'll be around when Jenny gets out of jail Boy, Jenny Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. Well, for the last year of Roger's earthly life, uh, one of his closest associations, ladies and gentlemen, was with one of the few men who could claim to match Roger's enthusiasm for collecting music on record, even though I must tell you he's a little modest and would never claim it himself, all right? Philip Swern, he was Roger's mate, his friend, his producer of those distinctive Sunday night shows on Radio One that kept so many of us from our slumbers. And Philip's got just a couple of words he'd like to say. Thank you, Fluff. Well, I've known Roger uh, ever since he first joined Capital Radio. And although in those days, we were only on sort of grunting terms in the corridor. And it wasn't until just under two years ago that we really actually worked together when Capital announced it was going to launch its gold service and run it every Sunday as an experiment. Roger was to be the first presenter, and I was given the job by Richard Park to build all the programs. As a long-time admirer of Roger's work, I was terrified about putting this running order together for him. I, I can't remember how long it took me to come up with a final list of 60 records, but for that first show. But I do recall it took me four days to finally pluck up courage to present him with a script, and with hands trembling, only slightly less than they are today, saying, you understand it's only a rough running order, it'll, it'll all change before the show goes out. <laughs> Well, he spent what seemed to be an eternity absorbing this wretched list, and I knew he hated every record on there. And then he looked at me and said, well, why would you want to change anything? <laughs> we worked together for several months on gold, and uh, I just looked forward to every Sunday we worked, we worked together. And when he left Capital to join Radio One, we kept in touch, and one Sunday evening I was driving home from work and caught Scott on Sunday on Radio One and thought, it was one of the best programs I'd ever heard, such a broad spectrum of music. Then, to my utter amazement, just about a year ago, I received a call from Johnny Bearding, asking me if I'd be interested in building the show, and also to work with another of my heroes, Alan Freeman. But don't, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> I mean, to go and work on Pick of the Pops and Scott on Sunday, I'd probably have paid the BBC to do it, but don't tell Johnny Bearding that. <laughs> well, we worked on this show for nine months, and every, I used to type the running order by, by hand at home on my computer, and often left out records, but put the CD in the box, and the record wasn't on the list, but Roger would look at the CD and program the record that I'd intended to play anyway. It was, it was incredible the way he did that. And Fluff was saying that uh, he's probably up there watching us now, and I, I still sent him around. I was putting a program together only last week, and I played two records at home back to back, and, and I thought they don't work, and I heard him going, no, that's no good. <laughs> God bless you, Roger. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pip, better known as Philip Swern. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Roger's encyclopedic knowledge of our musical heritage was matched by, uh, we could say, his infectious enthusiasm for the very best of contemporary music.
and for that very reason, we're asking one of his great buddies to come up on stage and sing us a very special song. The very special buddy is Mr. Chris Rea, and if you didn't know, he's the gentleman who actually can tell us Roger Scott's favorite city of all time. Would you welcome Chris Rea? of Paris seems somehow sadly swayed the glory that was Rome is of another day I've been terribly alone and forgotten in Manhattan I'm going home to my city by the bay I left my heart in San Francisco high on a hill it calls to me to I'm halfway to the stars The morning fog May chill the air But I don't care My love waits there In San Francisco the sky and windy sea when I come home to you San Francisco your golden sun Thank you very much indeed, Chris Rea, and thank you, Max Middleton, at the piano. And now we all know that Roger's favorite city was indeed San Francisco. Well, Leslie, and ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to tell you about Roger's dry wit, do we? It's been a source of pleasure to his regular audience for years, but in 1986, as we all know, listeners to Capital Radio were given a new treat when Roger joined the Sunday brunch team, which included Jan Ravens. Go on. There. It's great to see so many perpetrators and so many lovers of good music here today. And as music lovers, sorry to borrow your catchphrase there, Fluff, as music lovers, I know that you'll all be thrilled to hear that Alid Jones has just released his first album since his voice broke. Um, it's called Never Mind the Bollocks, This is Alid Jones. <laughs> so, so uh, Roger Scott. The man, the music, the pair of tight denim shorts. 
uh, I first worked with uh, Rog when Capital uh, mooted a, a comedy and rock program in early 1986. Uh, sort of round the funky horn, if you like. Uh, but this was to become Brunch, uh, on which Roger, Paul Burnett, Jeremy Pascal, Steve Brown, and Angus Deaton, and myself worked together on week in, week out for two years. It actually wasn't so much a job. It was more a sort of, you know, place to go on a Sunday morning to see your mates and have a laugh. Uh, although, obviously, a lot of preparation went into the program, well, a, a bit, Anyway, uh, Roger was always there at the planning meeting on a Thursday, uh, suggesting very naughty and often completely mad ideas to be put into the show on Sunday, and then completely disassociate, disassociating himself from them when the show was going out live on the Sunday morning. Um, and that preparation carried on right up until the last minute. Uh, just before the show, Jeremy Pascal would be rifling through the news of the world to see if there were any last-minute dafters. Uh, I would be buried in the, in the mirror to see if Suzanne Mitzi or Linda Lusardi had said anything quotable or indeed even intelligible uh, that week. Uh, Steve, Angus and Paul would be sifting through for some sizzling piece of satire and Rog would be buried in the Times or the Telegraph studying the financial pages to see how his shares were doing. <laughs> Wearing a pair of tight denim shorts. Uh, although we wound up being like a sort of bizarre surrogate comedy family, initially nobody was terribly keen on the idea. For his part, Roger had reluctantly agreed to try it out for a few weeks and see how it went. Meanwhile, I, being a shy, retiring type, was telling the program controller that the last thing an intelligent, witty comedy show needed was a disc jockey. I mean, for God's sake, were they really an intelligent life form? Well, um... <laughs> Hi, I'm an amoeba. Re remember this one? Anyway, um, <laughs> it's a bit, <laughs> a bit hard on disc jockeys as a profession, uh, yes. And 18 months later, when they were trying to take Roger off brunch in order to do the weekend breakfast show, I was busy eating my words. Up in the managing director's office this time, shouting at him about how brilliant Roger was, how witty, how cool, how technically brilliant, in short, completely irreplaceable. And uh, Roger, too, uh, had changed his tune. I suppose that's what he was paid for, um, and had said that he was willing to broadcast for a marathon five hours in order to carry on doing the program straight after the breakfast show. Um, without Roger's considerable reputation and weight, brunch may never have got beyond its first splutteringly incompetent couple of months. And far from being ill at ease with uh, a whole crowd of people in a studio where he was accustomed to being a one-man band, brunch seemed to fit him like a glove. And when the rabble threatened to get out of hand, Roger's dry quips would come in, easily topping the rest of us, his sharp reposts having the added advantage of being able to slam on some music straight away as a sort of brilliantly timed sting to his own punchline. If only real life were like that, you know. Uh, well, so's your old man. Da -da 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 -da. But it's not, so there. Anyway, he was a great sounding board. <laughs> He was a great sounding board for all our sketches and ideas and everything, because we all knew that he wasn't a man that was easily amused. And so um, when the pre-recorded sketches, in which he hadn't been involved, were played into the live program on a Sunday, we'd all be sort of sneaking apprehensive glances at Rog and being really chuffed, you know, if he giggled, and um, sometimes having to put up with more Thatcher bashing. Leslie won't like it. <laughs> Sorry about that, Leslie. Uh, as you can imagine, on a live show with five of us scrambling around, it, wasn't, uh, it was vital, rather, that someone kept some semblance of control, and Rog was the epitome of cool. It was an incredibly technically complicated show to run. Lots of accurate timings were required, things like sketches on carts being played over intros of records. Sorry about all the showbiz abbreviations. Uh, but he never flapped. Not even when the supposedly infallible CD player failed to queue up and Rod would be faced not only with silence, but with four faces looking at him going. Uh, we never actually realized quite how complicated the show was to run until Roger was off and the usually very adept Belgian engineer had to do it in his place. Morning, Philippe. Um, I think... Uh, <laughs> I think Brunch appealed to Roger's sense of fun and irreverence. Not only did he relish the opportunity to talk about farting, say what you like, it was a sophisticated show, and, uh, but he was always one of the first down to reception afterwards to see how many complaints we'd got, and uh, was always very disappointed on a rare week if we'd failed to get any. 
We were always quite surprised that no one ever sued us, as much of the humor of the program veered more towards straightforward abuse of showbiz personalities, of which Roz, Rog was particularly fond, enjoying a good laugh about a fellow DJ being described as a sperm sample presenting Seaside Special. It seemed to uh, give our garbled comedy offerings more weight by the fact that they were sandwiched between this brilliant music that Roger and the producer, John Pigeon, always chose. Although they did once almost um, have a stand-up fight about which track from a crowded house album to play. Uh, Rog, you know, it wasn't anything trivial or anything. Um, Rog generally didn't mind taking the piss out of the music, although he did draw the line when Steve and I said that Huey Lewis in concert looked more like Jack Duckworth. Um, but we never quite knew how, how deep and how wide Roger's lover's love of music was until this artist appeared on the Brunch Classic Collection. This is CFM and the uh, moment we've all been looking forward to around the table ah. here, especially is uh, the results of last week's Classic Collection vote. The answer phone almost blew up with the, uh, the oh, number of calls that came no in. No surprise there, surely. Well, here we go. Yeah. This is uh, the moment, as I say, we've all been waiting for. Uh, the results of last week's classic collection vote, which yeah. was um, all about the, well, the career and the life and times of Roger Whittaker. Yeah. And, uh, I, thought, I thought we'd hear a few of our, uh, our listeners oh, who, uh, yes, who, who sure. called in the vote. Who, who, up for that? I'm a great fan of Roger Whittaker. Uh, you know, I've, I've loved his records for years, so I'm going to nominate my favourite record of all time, which is Bimbo, you know. Bimbo, Bimbo, where you going to go? Yeah. Hello, Brunch. I'm voting for my favourite all-time Roger Whittaker track. It goes like this. The Last Farewell. Well, some of those taking the piss. I adored him as a broadcaster. I, I loved him as a man. I mean, without him, brunch would have been um, a mess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it would have been a sort of sprawling, incoherent whatnot. But with Rog at the helm, the music was tight, the comedy was tight, and the denim shorts were tight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rog. Thank you very much, Jan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, by the launch of Brunch, Roger had been converted to the joys of CD. So much so that he got rid of the whole of his, <coughs> pardon me, so much so that he got rid of the whole of his vinyl collection and began the task of reassembling his musical catalogue in digital sound. But in any format, you know, one of his favourite musicians was the man whose work with Dire Straits symbolised that technological revolution in the way that we source our music, right? And on stage now, to join in the celebration of the life of Roger Scott, would you please welcome Mr. Mark Knopfler and Guy Fletcher. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I should say that uh, in between uh, Roger's interviews with me, uh, last one was I think when I was producing a Randy Newman record and one before that I think we were talking about uh, an album called Brothers in Arms. Uh, both very enjoyable experiences and always, you know, over the years. Well, in between that and touring with Eric Clapton and doing film scores and other things, I was making a record with some old friends of mine that I've known even longer than Roger uh, from Leeds and places. And we called ourselves the Notting Hillbillies, and I was recording them at home. And uh, <laughs> we found out w what had happened to Roger when we were one track short on this album. We were just about to do the last song. I got a telephone call at my little home studio. And Ed, my manager, said, let's send the tape straight over to Roger. And I said, well, <sighs> we'd love to do that, but there's this last song to do, which has got to be on there. Um, because it's appropriate that Roger should hear this song. And, and of course, life being what it is, Roger went and left us before I, I could get it to him. So, even though I'm not really the man to sing this song, which is sung by somebody who really can sing, uh, 
Roger, if you're up there, this is the last track on side two of our Hill Village record. Lord, I feel like going home Tried and I failed I'm tired and weary Everything I ever done was wrong Feel like going home. Lord, I try to see it through. skies rolling in and not a friend around to help me from all the places I have been Feel like going home. Lord, I feel like going home. I tried and I failed.
Thank you, Mark, very much, and thank you, Guy Fletcher. Well, there you know, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the record industry, there aren't many disc jockeys who've won total universal respect. Okay? And we have a gentleman from WEA Records, Mr. Young Chris Mason, all right, who thought that he would like to say something because he counted Roger very dearly as a friend. So, Chris, come and tell us. Um, actually, just um, listening to Mark Knopfler, I remember when he was uh, actually doing the session with um, Randy Nearman. Um, Roger really wanted his photo taken um, with Mark Knopfler. I had my camera there, and he wouldn't dare ask Knopfler if he'd have his picture taken with him. So consequently, um, I later gave Roger about 20 pictures of Mark Knopfler's back and Roger smiling at the side. <laughs> <coughs> Just remembered that. <coughs> um, the first record I ever bought was the Beach Boys, Good Vibrations. And 12 years ago, when I was working as a sales rep, the best part of that job was driving around listening to Roger between 4 and 7 on the radio. Um, a couple of years later, I started doing promotions and one of the first lunches that I ever went on was with Arthur Sheriff and Roger Scott. I remember it very, very well, meeting this big hero of mine and him completely ignoring me. <laughs> I never let him forget that. And after that, we became good friends. I went to him, with him to a Springsteen concert a couple of years ago. So I was very, very interested to see, you know, whether this normally laid back, really cool guy would turn into a raving madman. He didn't. He just went into a trance and tapped his fingers all the way through. Roger's knowledge and, mu and enthusiasm for music and ability to interview every conceivable sort of artist was incredible. Every Monday morning he'd be on the phone finding out what we had going on and moaning about what he could or couldn't have. He loved a good moan, did old Roger. People in our business are very, very lucky. We're in a lucky position. And why I mentioned the Beach Boys was that last year I spent three months chasing Brian Wilson around America for an interview for Roger. To know Roger was great, to have him as a good friend was a great privilege. And last night I was uh, talking to John Pigeon on the phone and thinking, was today, was this really what Roger would have wanted? And yes, it is, because I know Roger would have sneaked in his Sony Walkman and recorded the whole bloody lot. Chris Mason from WA. Chris, Roger loves you. We love you too. You did tremendously. All right. Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't just that Roger enjoyed sharing his music with the rest of us. He also derived enormous pleasure from talking to musicians about their work. And from the way in which they agreed to take part in his programs, it was pretty clear that music makers themselves enjoyed talking to somebody who quite clearly understood everything that they were talking about and everything that they were putting on record. Some of those people have been in touch. I would like to read some of their messages. Having worked with Roger Scott and enjoyed his company immensely, you too would like to express their sympathy to his family and friends because the broadcasting community has lost a true music lover and we share the sense of loss that is being felt by Roger's many friends and colleagues. That is from you too. I also have another communication here that reads, sorry, we can't be with you, to say thanks just for being you. We will all miss you, Barry, Robin, and Morris Gibb, the Bee Gees. And finally, out of all the many that we have received this morning, one Mr. John Pigeon was awoken rather rudely from his bed at 1.15 to take a fax that came from Los Angeles, which reads, Roger was one of those rare, refreshing people who was in the music business because he liked music. He had a great deal of enthusiasm for the records he played and the music 
and the musicians that he admired. He was also a nice guy. He will be greatly missed by many. I will miss his smile, like when I used to give Roger, give Roger some Roger McQuinn bootlegs. And Roger, if you can, tell me where to send the tapes from now on. Love and peace, Tom Petty. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, and music lovers, Roger was very much the kind of man who wanted to be self-contained. He rarely asked for help, or he rarely shared a burden. And the Independent said in his obituary, and I quote, he had no time for the cult of personality. His strength lay in the one-to-one -one relationships that he built with radio listeners who came to share his own fascination with music and music making. End of quote. His influence on music radio has been enormous, and his legacy is with those presenters whose commitment to music outweighs their enthusiasm for self-promotion. And it's my pleasure now to tell you that the man who wrote those words is and was and still is Roger's friend and colleague, and his name is Tim Blackmore. Well, I can't beat Paul Gambaccini's record. I first uh, came across Roger 15 years ago. I was still working for Radio 1, but I'd heard a little bit of his programming and wanted to meet the man responsible for it. I subsequently worked with him for six of those years, and through the last seven or so, I think I gained just about enough confidence in the relationship to believe that he probably counted me as a friend. And I use those words deliberately because as I think you've heard from other people, I don't think that Roger gave friendship very easily. I don't think that he accepted friendship from those who wanted to give it easily either. Because the guy that we're honoring today was in every sense of the word a strong man. He wanted to be, and in many ways he was, as Alan already indicated, self-sufficient. Through the years that we spent together at, at Capital, he seemed to me to embody the very essence of that station. Independent, authoritative, always seductive of the listener's attention, and more often than not, a little cheeky. Well, I can't pretend that professional life with Roger was always easy. If anyone was their own man, it was dear old Rog. I remember when we asked him to join the other capital jocks in waving to the crowds, all those lovely capital listeners, from a float in the Lord Mayor's Parade. <laughs> it seemed to us a good idea at the time. <laughs> his usual gift for proper use of the English language, he seemed to feel that that was not necessarily the best use of his talents. <laughs> when he decided to give an unsolicited airing to one of Paul McCartney's songs, which, as I recall, was recorded here at Abbey Road, he managed to unleash even my wrath. He managed me to make, break my golden rule, which has always been that you don't give a presenter a bollocking while he's still on air, because that gets in the way of the relationship with the listeners. You wait till he comes off. The problem was that in true Roger style, the track had only been recorded the previous day, let alone cleared for airplay, published, issued through PPL, anything. God alone knows where he got the tape. And so with the sound of Ritz still ringing in my ears, I stormed into the on-air studio. Roger stared at me wide-eyed and told me the tape had arrived on his desk in a plain brown envelope and he hadn't a clue where it came from. <laughs> I loved Roger, so of course I believed him. In a sense, of course, that was exactly why Roger was a broadcaster. And even more to the point, that was why he was such an excellent broadcaster. He had this irresistible urge to share his enthusiasm. To share his enthusiasm for quality music, for good singers, good songs, and good sounds. There were days, especially towards the end, when I suspect that Roger felt that perhaps the world of music radio was letting him down a bit. That it no longer sounded as he believed it should. Perhaps he'd heard 
too much that was disposable, too much that was shallow, too much that was contrived rather than created. But for more than 20 years, Rogers' own broadcasting was the very antithesis of terms like that. Roger believed that recording artists should be celebrated in accordance with their ability to make music, not merely in accordance with their marketing potential. For Roger, the disc jockey's role was central to the listener's enjoyment of music. He created the right context for its performance. He brought the very best out of an interviewee. Listening to Roger was truly a joy. In broadcasting to a general audience, he seemed to me to have earned the kind of respect that's usually been reserved just for those who serve a more specialist audience. To his fellow jocks, he was undoubtedly Big Rog, the team leader. To his colleagues, he was that rock-like presence which was invaluable. And to his friends within the world of music making, his approach was always the one that mattered. For Leslie, for Jamie, for Graham, for his dad Derek, the loss is of course indescribably personal. But for every one of us, there is ample reason for us to genuinely give thanks for Roger's all too brief life and for his outstanding contribution to music radio. When Mark Gemino released his story of Rex Bob Lowenstein, which will be known to most of you, Roger, I guess, felt the heartbeat of a, of a kindred spirit. I suspect that even super cool Rog would have been knocked out to know that Mark has come over from the States and joined us today, and he'll be sharing his song with us in a moment. Roger's belief was that music makers and music broadcasters should always maintain a commitment to real music, to music as something that moves us physically or emotionally, to music as something that touches the very ground of our being. That Roger was able to embrace such a philosophy and to bring so much of his own love and knowledge into our lives is indeed just cause for this celebration today. We shall miss you, Rog. But it's right and proper that we should also give thanks for all that he meant to us as individuals, for all that he meant to our profession, and for all that he brought to our radio listening. We should also perhaps seek to do something to ensure that as fellow believers we play our part in ensuring a future for the kind of music radio that Roger Scott exemplified. When the news of Roger's illness became public, he was supported not just by all the good wishes and positive thoughts from his friends and his family, but in particular, he drew support from the hundreds of letters from his radio listeners. And I know that Leslie's delighted that so many of you have been able to be here today. About a month before he died, Roger showed me one letter that seemed to sum up what I can only describe as a, a sense of anticipated loss that had been shared and expressed by many, many others. There were hundreds of letters, quite literally. Roger, on one particularly sad afternoon, worried that he'd only been a disc jockey. But when you read a letter like this, he said, you begin to think that perhaps it was all right after all. The guy who wrote that letter was a, a guy called Richard Simmons from North London. And Richard, I'd like you to come up here and share that letter with us now. Richard Simmons. Dear Roger, this is definitely the most difficult letter I've ever had to write. I heard the sad news from a friend who, like me, has been listening to you for well over a decade. I remembered all the times I listened to your show and how repeatedly I just couldn't believe how good the music was and what a good broadcaster you are. Whenever I look back on my adolescence, I look at it synonymously with listening to Roger Scott on the radio. You're a part of my growing up. Listening to music really wouldn't have been as much fun if you hadn't been on the radio. 
I particularly remember the late 70s, coming home from school and listening to the radio on the bus with the story of the 70s and the hit line top 10, which I think was 15 on Fridays. Then there was the biggest moment in my musical history, when in 1980 I got into Bruce Springsteen. Of course, you'd been one of his earliest admirers in this country, and so to you, everyone else was just discovering what you'd known for years. Apart from Bruce, you'd so often play a new band, and I'd immediately start listening to more of their material. Your taste in music is excellent. Your sharp, witty comments on everyday events brought a rare and glorious humor to my radio listening. One of my personal favorites of your recent career was Brunch on Capitol. Days Yourself, Jeremy Pascal, Paul Burnett, Jam Raven, Steve Brown, and Angus Deaton brought me incredible joy. Every Sunday, I set my alarm for 10 o'clock, and as well as hearing the show live, I tape it to hear again during the week. I don't really know the purpose of this letter. It's really just to say thank you for all the good times I've had listening to your shows on the radio. You've been one of the greatest influences in my life, and I've never even met you. All it comes down to, basically, is love of the music at the start of it and throughout it all, and wanting to share that with other people, and not wanting to share that love of the music, wanted to share this new record that I've just found, this thing that I've heard. Oh, listen, you've got to hear this, but not wanting it really to go beyond that, not wanting to you know, boost myself into some, you know, something that I'm not, but really all down to that, just let's share this. I've got to play this for somebody, and it's not going to be these kids walking down the street in Surbiton. You know, I've got this bigger record player now, and I can actually play it for all these people, and let's see what they think of it. And it's not, uh, you know, it was never to use it for something else. It was never to because that, for, for me, that would, um, that would corrupt the whole thing. You know, if you were actually using this for another end, to promote one's self, or for whatever reason, that would, uh, that would spoil the whole magic of the thing. There's a disc jockey in Hardlinburg who works W-A-N-T He puts two or three eggs in him Then he's in your car by six eight. He lives for his job and he accepts his pay You can call and request Lay, 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 lay He'll play Stanley Jordan, you two and little feet And he'll even play the band from the college down the street And his name is Rex Bob Lowenstein He's 47 going on 16 His request line's open But he'll tell you where to go If you're dumb enough to ask him Why he plays Hank Snow Tries to keep his talking to a minimum He's a Democrat, he's a Republican He's an ad man with a great voice, say some But when he spins those records, he's neither one He'll talk to the truckers on the interstate strip The housewife and the car dealership And when his second wife left him for a paper millionaire he cried unashamedly right on the air And his name is Rex Bob Lowenstein He's 47 going on 16 His request line's open but he makes no bones About why he plays Madonna after George Jones
One day a man in a pinstripe suit Took the owner of the station to a restaurant booth His pitch was simple, you'll increase your sales If you only play the song list we send in the mail He guaranteed a larger audience Less confusion and higher points But you drive time, Jock won't get to do his thing Hey, he's not half bad, tell me what's his name Well, his name is Rex Bob Lowenstein He's frequently heard, but he's seldom seen His formula's simple and his format's big I just play it, then you call and tell me what you did Now Rex Bob David saw Lowenstein quit his job a week later but before he'd leave he locked and bolted the control room door and played smash or trash till they cuffed him on the floor Well they drug him into court and the judge said Rex I gotta lock you up for what I'm not sure yet but your boss here says he thinks you're wrapped too tight But by the way, thanks for playing Moon River last night And his name is Rex Bob Lowenstein He's a frame and bell inside a tambourine And he could play it all if he was just set free Just to find what the people W-A-N-T Just to find what the people W-A-N-T Just to find what the people W-A-N-T Over to a little studio not too far from here where they've uh, set up the band, and I'm just going to say, Yo Dion. Hi there. <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> Yo Roger. Oh boy, I've been looking forward to this. I can't tell you for how long. Right, we're going to um, take it right back to the very, very, very beginning. We'll try it for you. Go on then. <laughs> I told my friends we would never part. They laughed and said you would break my heart. I wonder why they think that we will part.
Dion and the band live with I Wonder Why, and you're coming back in about an hour, so you can go and have another sandwich. All right. All right. Thanks, Dion. Um, I'd just like to finish off by thanking everybody that's taken part in today, and thank everybody for being here today. And also a huge, huge thank you for all the people that worked very hard to get this together. Chris Mason, John Pigeon, Tim Blackmore, Johnny Beeling, Malcolm Hill, Phil Swern, Fluff, Kevin Howlett, and Aidan Day. They really have worked very, very hard. Um, and I'd just like to finish off by saying one very short thing. How incredibly privileged we have all been to either have known Roger personally or have listened to him on the radio, but no one more so than me. I really was the very, very lucky one. I loved him to bits, and I always will. Thank you very much. Shine. 